Welcome to the fourth part of the class where I'm going to talk about the story directory. If this was a real class, I would probably talk more about the story as a whole and the love stories there and the stories uh, and the relationship between uh, Mr. Spring Fragrance and Mrs. Spring Fragrance. But since, since these are short videos, I'm going to focus on giving you examples of uh, use of irony, which is the subject of this class. Irony is the double uh, language that is so uh, suitable to talking, uh, to writing uh, minor literature, minority literature. Start at the beginning. Okay. This is the very first paragraph of the story. When Mrs. Spring Fragrance, okay, Mrs. Spring Fragrance, She's a Chinese woman, obviously her name isn't Spring Fragrance, but it's a direct translation of a Chinese name, or at least that's what we expect to understand. So when Mrs. Spring Fragrance first arrived in Seattle, she was unacquainted with even one word of the American language. Okay, she's a recent immigrant, she doesn't speak English. Five years later, her husband, speaking of her, said, there are no more American words for her learning. Okay, there are no more American words for her learning. Now, English has like a quarter million words. She must have other words to learn. So this is an exaggeration. Whenever we see an ex exaggeration, maybe there's some irony here. Is Mr. Spring Fragrance making fun of his wife? I don't think so. It's uh, probably the, the author making the character, somebody who exaggerates, who says things uh, that aren't exactly true, and she ironizes Mr. Spring Fragrance, okay? Irony can go against Chinese people as well, not just against white people, as we'll see uh, later on. And everyone who knew Mrs. Spring Fragrance agreed with Mr. Spring Fragrance. Okay, everyone. Whenever we hear everyone, we can be suspicious. So there is a little irony even from the beginning and making gentle fun of uh, the uh, Chinese community uh, that's being described. Um, a little later on, Mrs. Uh, Spring Fragrance is, um, is consulting, uh, consoling a young friend of her, and she says, uh, who can't be with the, the guy she likes, with the, the man she loves. She has to marry somebody else. Now little sister comfort, uh, co comforted Mrs. Spring Fragrance. You really must not grieve like that. Is there not a beautiful American poem written by a noble American named Tennyson, which says, it is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? Okay, now the irony here is again, again uh, about a Chinese character, uh, about Mrs. Uh, uh, Spring Fragrance. Alfred Lord Tennyson, is English, is not American. But for her, all the Westerners, all, everybody who writes in English is a kind of American. So we already know that even though we heard that she's so Americanized and so Westernized, she still has a lot of gaps in her knowledge. The next section, again, iron, um, a different, slightly different kind of irony. Let me stress that the irony is not devastating, it's not very critical, just making gentle fun, maybe drawing us into an atmosphere of ironizing all of the characters. So when the criticism against white, white society is voiced, we're not too taken aback. Mrs. Uh, Spring Fragrance was unaware that Mr. Spring Fragrance had returned from, uh, from the city, tired with the day's business, had thrown himself down on the bamboo settee on the veranda. So he's sitting outside, the women are inside. 
is that although his eyes were engaged in scanning the pages of the Chinese world, a kind of newspaper, but also he's in the Chinese world, his ears could not help receiving the words which were born to him through the open window. So they're speaking and there's another person listening. So there's a kind of irony in that a distance between what she thinks her audience is, just the young girl, and who the audience actually is, also her husband. And he hears the same uh, lines of poetry. It's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. And he's going to understand it in a different way than it was intended by his wife because he doesn't know that the story that the lines are about the young friend's uh, troubles. He's going to think, he's going to think that his wife is the one who has loved and lost. Okay, overhearing or misunderstanding, it's not exactly irony, but it has the same structure, right? You think nobody's, nobody's listening to you, but somebody you're not expecting is listening to you. There's a, this kind of ironic distance. Okay, so uh, Mr. Spring uh, Fragrance, he's not a poet, he's a, he's a merchant, and his English is not as good as his wife. He hasn't read as much, but he does have a neighbor, a white neighbor who's very educated, and he comes to him for help understanding what these lines, these lines mean. Will you tell, will, will you please tell me, said Mr. Spring Fragrance, the meaning of two lines of an American verse which I have heard. Certainly, returned the young man with a genial smile. He was a star student at the University of Washington and had not the slightest doubt that he could explain the meaning of all things to, in the universe. Okay, again, this exaggeration that leads us to understand that uh, the sentence is ironic. Okay, here the irony is turned towards the white student. He couldn't possibly explain everything in the universe, but he thinks of himself as somebody who can explain everything in the universe. So when we hear he can explain everything in the universe, we see that there is a kind of satire and irony around this uh, young man, and he's going to be the target of uh, quite a lot of uh, satire throughout the story. Ah, this is a direct continuation of uh, that scene. Ah, responded the young man with an air of profound wisdom. Again, an air of profound wisdom. It says profound wisdom, but it's only the air. It's only, only as if he has profound wisdom. That, Mr. Spring Fragrance, means that it is a good thing to love anyway, even if we can't get what we love, or as the poet tells us, lose what we, what we love. Of course, one needs to experience to feel the truth of this teaching. Okay. He explains the literal meaning of the text. It's better to love someone, even if you're going to lose them. Okay, that's what he said. But then he, a little proud, too proud of himself, he says, of course, one needs experience to feel the truth of this teaching. Okay, maybe you are not going to understand, you're older than me, but you're not going to understand this poem because you don't have my experience. Okay, the young man smiled pensively with sadness. Pensively means with sadness and uh, reminiscently, like thinking back about the past, right? We remember this is an American college student. He's 18, 19, but he's thinking, maybe 20. He's thinking, he's thinking back to his past. More than a dozen young maidens loved and lost were passing before his mind's eye. So he's thinking about girls that he had crushes on. Okay, and he thinks that's the experience is building his deep understanding of the poem around. But this is a poem most of the readers of the story, uh, when it was first published, should have known this. 
a poem about somebody who died young, a friend of Alfred Lord Tennyson who died young. It's not about the crush that uh, you lose. It's about a deep connection to someone, real, real love. Amen. Okay, so we talked about the first uh, section of the story. And now we move forward. Mrs. Spring Fragrance is on a visit to San Francisco. And she's writing a letter to her uh, husband from there. It's a very polite letter, you'll see. Very polite, but stick with irony. Whose irony is it? Uh, the author's or um, Mrs. Spring Fragrance? It's not 100% clear. Great and honored men, greeting from your plum blossom. This is like the name she takes her, uh, gives herself this delicate flower that's supposed to bring you luck. And the flowers that uh, I put in the beginning of the presentation are indeed plum blossoms. Who is desirous of hiding herself from the sun of your presence? for a week of, or of seven days more. My honorable cousin is preparing for, for the fifth moon festival and wishes me to compound, uh, to compound for the occasion some American fudge for which delectable sweet made by, made by my clumsy hands, you have sometimes shown a slight prejudice. Okay, this is a kind of irony, kind of irony that belittles the speaker. She says, my clumsy hands, right? She says clumsy hands, but really she's a good cook. She may, makes good fudge. And you showed slight prejudice. I'm guessing he liked it a lot, but it's not polite to say you really liked what I made. She has to uh, belittle herself and you said slight prejudice. You preferred it over other things a little bit. Okay, over herself, she can be ironic, but again, gently. Um, she continues, I am enjoying a most agreeable, agreeable visit and American friends as also our own strive benevolently with goodwill for the accomplishment of my pleasure. Everybody wants me to have fun. I don't think that's ironic. But then, um, then the irony is turned on. Mrs. Samuel Smith, an American lady known to my cousin, asked accompaniment to magniloquent lecture the other, uh, the other evening. Magniloquent means using high language and bom bombastic language. Okay, maybe um, it's not a nice way to describe a lecture, but maybe she means it more like towards the direction of magnificent or impressive. Maybe it was an impressive lecture. The subject was America, the protector of China. It was most exhilarating and the effect of so much expression of benevolence leads me to beg of you to forget to remember that the barber charged you a dollar for a shave while he humbly submits to, American, uh, to, to the American man a bill of 15 cents, okay? A shave for a Chinese person costs like almost 10 times as much as for a white person. But she says, oh, the lecture was so sympathetic, so benevolent, so it had so much goodwill about it. Please forget, please remember to forget that you're angry at the white people for mistreating you. Who means, who, who's, uh, this has to be ironic on some level, okay? Nobody would forgive uh, being so overcharged uh, just because they belong to a different race. I don't think that's what the author means us to understand here. Does Mrs. Spring uh, Fragrance really uh, expect us to, expect her husband to forget? 
I'm not sure. I think maybe uh, um, Mrs. Spring Fragrance is the one being ironic here. But possibly it's the author making fun of Mrs. Spring Fragrance who wants her hu husband to be overly forgiving. And anyways, it's a chance for uh, Suisin Far to insert this information about mistreatment into her story in an, in an ironic way as part of jabbing this, this idea of America is protecting China. Um, and murmur no more because you're, and, and it gets worse, and murmur no more because your honored elder brother on a visit to this country is detained under the roof tree of the great government instead of under your own humble roof. Okay, because he's Chinese, he's being detained in a camp or in a prison instead of actually being able to visit his brother. Okay, and she says, oh, forgive them, they have such um, good intentions. How can you forgive, um, how can you forgive a government for putting your uh, brother in, in prison just because he's Chinese? It's not a fair expectation. I don't know. Uh, she either spring fragrance doesn't mean it, or at least the author wants us to not accept that it's a good idea to forgive for such a sin, for such a act. Console him with the reflection that he is protected under the wings of the eagle, the emblem of liberty. Right, the United States government is the eagle. It gives liberty, so that's why he has to be detained in a prison. Okay, the distance between what the U.S. says that it's doing and what they are actually doing uh, is brought to the surface here through the irony of the story itself. What is the loss of 1,000 years or 10,000 times $10 compared with the happiness of knowing oneself so securely sheltered. Okay, are you sheltered if they're putting you in prison or putting your brother in prison? Not really. All of this I have learned from Mrs. Samuel Smith, who is as brilliant and great of mind as one of your own superior sex. Maybe making a little fun of men who think that they are the superior sex. So that's the letter that she sends her husband. Actually, he permits her to stay in San Francisco, but he's not really happy about it because he's still jealous. But, so he's going to have another conversation with his white neighbor. And there, again, the same kind of irony about how Americans present, present themselves versus what they actually do to Chinese people, to Chinese Americans as well. Uh, so they are having a conversation, and the, the white uh, neighbor and Mr. Spring Fragrance, and and we hear more about um, about the detention pen. Sure, cheerfully assented the young man. Haven't you ever heard that all Americans are princes and princesses? And just as soon as a foreigner puts his foot upon our shores, he also becomes the nobility, I mean, the royal family. Okay, this is the idea of America as the land of the free. It's not like Europe where there are classes and some people are born to be poor and some people are born to nobility and royalty. No, in America, everybody is equal and everybody is royalty. And of course, to Mr. Spring Fragrance, this is not his experience of it. Okay, he sees through it. What about my brother in the detention pen? Dryly inquired Mr. Spring Fragrance, right? Dry, when you say something dryly, it's often because you have, you, you're saying it ironically. Now, now you've got me, now you caught me. You know that I'm not telling the truth, said young, uh, the young man rubbing his head. Well, that is, a, that is a shame, a beastly shame, as the Englishman says. But understand, old fellow, we, we, we that are true Americans are up against that. 
even more than you. It's against our principles. So he's, some, he's saying something really strange. He's saying, it's more difficult for me to have to detain your brother because it goes against my principle. I believe in liberty. I was raised on liberty because I'm American. And we are made to do this somehow and it goes against our principles. So it's really difficult for us to treat you badly because it goes against our principles. Okay, we can't, as readers, we can't take this idea seriously. It just shows us how some Americans prefer to feel sorry for themselves for how they treat others and they have the privilege to feel sorry for themselves for how they uh, treat others and, and that's exactly how Mr. Uh, Spring Fragrance uh, takes it. I offer the real Americans, right, he repeats the same phrase, real Americans. He has to be quite quite ironic when he repeats this idea that only the white people or only the people who were raised in America are the real Americans. By uh, my consolations, I'm sorry for you, that they should be compelled to do that which is against their principles. I, I'm, I feel sorry for you for having to treat my uh, brother, to put my brother in, the, in jail. Poor you. So he has to, I can't treat this any other way than making fun of the young man. Don't know if the young man understand it, understands it like that. So we see moving from some irony about the Chinese people and their society about self-deprecating irony uh, into using irony and this dialogue and the letters to really criticize the way Americans treat Chinese people. 